All right, then let's get right to it. Let's welcome Kamal George. She is the holistic pharmacist. Prior to starting her practice in health and well-being, she was focused at the national level within the UK, doing everything from high-powered negotiations, setting the tariffs and supply chain issues in and around which drugs were coming in and out and how they were priced at the country. She's now part of an effort that's really a global movement that's shifting to lifestyle and functional medicine. As pharmacists are being faced with challenges like automation, they're moving increasingly into digital health. So with us today, let's welcome Kamal. Hello, Kamal. Hi, Laurelyn. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, it's always exciting. We love learning from all of the different guests that we have from all over the world in different industries. Maybe just tell us a little bit sort of of the state of the union, if you would, as far as pharmacy in general. Yeah, sure. So obviously here in the UK, pharmacy has, just like in the US actually, is going undergoing a bit of a revolution right now, I would describe it as. We have had digital health really almost thrusted in front of us. Um, most certainly through the period of COVID. If we, if we weren't aware of it, we certainly are well aware of it now. Now, you've been an entrepreneur yourself with respect to the turmeric capsule, otherwise known as, I guess, in the US, a lot of people call it a turmeric pill or a tablet. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and how you transitioned from a national level as a pharmacist into venturing out on your own? That's a big leap, Kamal. Yes, <laughs> I guess it. I guess it is a big leap. I, I really went down that route because of curiosity more than anything else. And so I became really interested in health and well-being during my pregnancy, actually, in uh, 2015. And, and that was kind of the catalyst for me that really, really kind of re, I would describe it as it kind of, it kind of reacquainted me with turmeric because I grew up with turmeric that's when I created my turmeric capsule because I was looking for an an immune booster post-pregnancy and I wanted something that was natural. And it has anti-inflammation properties as well, correct? That's right. Yeah. I mean, it has, it's an anti-inflammatory agent. It's a antibacterial agent. It is a mood booster. It's great for gut health. I mean, literally the list of benefits are endless. (laughs) You're helping others now who are currently acting as pharmacists, making their leaps and transitions into new pathways and careers. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, sure. So I I went on a bit of a journey myself when it comes to um, transitioning from national level to moving into the into the health and wellness space. And I was getting a lot of colleagues asking me about this journey And I've always had a passion for helping colleagues and mentoring and coaching and really kind of motivating and empowering others. And so I was able to use this opportunity to help my colleagues to be able to forge their own careers. And now that pharmacy itself is shifting massively in terms of its digitization, telehealth, it's creating these incredible opportunities for pharmacists to be able to to develop completely new career pathways. Now, this is a great segue for the next line of questioning that I had, which is in and around the whole notion that you switched, right? Big leap. You are at the national level negotiating supply chain. I mean, that's big and heavy stuff. And you made a leap to venture out on your own, to follow your values, follow your passions. And that's really the essence of what so many entrepreneurs do. So tell us, what do you wish that someone had told you? before you did that? What do I wish that someone had told me before I did that? Um, I, I wish that someone had told me that I would, I would make a lot of fa- failures along the way and that those failures are going to be learnings because I don't think I learned that early enough in my entrepreneurial journey. Um, I think I went through a period of time where I was I was doing the work and and I felt like I was running, spinning all these plates um, and couldn't really kind of pinpoint, okay, well, have I done this the right way? Have I moved in the right direction? And one of the things I feel that I actually wasn't very good at when I, when I first ventured out into the, um, you know, into the startup world, so to speak, was that, I needed to listen 
to my gut. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I don't think I did that enough in the beginning. And you hear that so often, right? All that self-doubt, either you're putting those messages in your own head or you're hearing it from the naysayers who are public saying, oh, why would you do that? Don't do it. You'll never be successful, right? At your age, at your stage, at whatever. And you hear that and you start to believe it after a while. Yeah, a hundred percent. Honest to God truth. So I, um, I created my turmeric capsule in my maternity leave. I went back to work and I didn't tell a single person at my work about it because I was so afraid of what they would think of what I had done. And um, that's just an example of how fear gets in the way. And it was really interesting because when I eventually did tell my colleagues about it, they were so proud of what I had done and they supported me. And, you know, sometimes we are our own biggest enemies, right? That we believe, we believe things that are completely unconfounded and, you know, we we don't realize that by talking about the things that we feel passionately about, that actually we will inspire and attract the right people to you. Overcoming fears, making these big leaps. I mean, these are challenges that most entrepreneurs face, but everybody has had at least one really memorable moment, the hardest thing that they've ever had to do. Would you care to share that with us, Kamal, whatever you're comfortable sharing personally or professionally? What's the hardest thing you had to do? What's the hardest thing that I've had to do? That's a really good question, actually. Um, when I look back, I mean, there are lots so many things I would say, you know, um, one of the hardest things that I had to do was, was actually to take up the role at, at the negotiator. I was given an opportunity and I started off there as head of information and then moved on and became head of dispensing and supply. But when I was given that role, I didn't believe that I could do that job, you know, and that was, it was so incredibly hard. There was a point where I was, I said to myself, I think I either, either I stick this out and I, and I just push through it or I leave now. And I'm so glad that I pushed through it because I learned so much through that experience. I felt so out of my depth. I was the youngest head of department. I was the only female as who was the head of department when I joined. And there were so many, uh, there, was, there was so much imposter syndrome going on then, which I had no idea was the case at the time. So yeah, that was one of the hardest experiences that I had to go through in my career, I think. Oh yeah, I mean, imposter syndrome is something we hear about, or certainly on this show, we discuss a lot. Every one of us has gone through it at, at some phase in our lives. And like you said, you either work through it or quit. And most of the gals I have in this show, they're not quitters. <laughs> <laughs> now, since we're talking about your past and looking backward, I'm going to give you some pixie dust and say, come on, you got to go back and you got to change one thing. What are you going to change? Wow. You got to change one thing. What, what do you know? The one thing I would definitely change is taking the leap to go on my entrepreneurial journey sooner. I, I really, I really do think I should have done it much more sooner than I did in the end. Um, trying to start a business whilst you've got a young child is, is not a good idea. <laughs> I would say half of the guests I have on this show say that they wish they had started it sooner. Yeah. So you're not alone. All right. Since we're talking about tips again, now we've gone through a few already because that's why the audience listens. Please share your best tip for the next generation of, we're going to say women in STEM. Mm -hmm. I, the biggest tip that I would give to anybody is spend the time in exploring what your personal values are and really, really hold them true to yourself. Um, whenever you have these opportunities that arise, really ask yourself the question of whether they are aligned to your values. And, and, and that I think is the, is the best thing that, that I've certainly learned going through my entrepreneurial journey. And I would want every single person, you know, every single STEM woman to, to think about. Excellent. Cause it really does come down to who you are, right? Not what you are. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there's a, I think also there's this thing of, with age as well, I would say that, you know, when I was in my twenties, I, I, I wouldn't have really known and I wouldn't have known myself enough to know what my values are. So I would also say, give yourself grace and give yourself the chance and the opportunity to explore because I often, sp I speak to many young pharmacists actually who contact me and there's this real hunger to find their thing now. And one of the things that I really encourage them to do is, is really embrace that exploratory phase in your career because that's the fun part of your career. <laughs> that's the part when you can really, really just, you know, if you don't like a job, you can quit and you can go off and do something else. And, you know, really give yourself the chance to, to try different things for sure. And we talked about this a bit before we started the podcast on air here and that you were a specialist. You went in to become a pharmacist. I was a generalist as a scientist. Really, I could have done multiple things. I guess you could argue it's a specialty, but yeah, we'll call it a generalist. And both of us chose multiple options. And that's the whole thing. You have that freedom. People don't realize that you don't have to be what your degree says you are. You have options. Uh, I couldn't agree with that more, Laurel, and I, I couldn't agree with that more. You know, if there's one thing that I've definitely learned, it is that because we should not be defining ourselves by our degrees or, you know, all our vocation, you know, we should be, we should really seek to find what our interests and our skills are and apply those it to any industry. Because I know that as a, as a healthcare professional, my skills are transferable to so many sectors and don't let the fear of pigeonholing yourself into a particular career stop you from exploring those. Oh, cheers to that, Kamal. All right. <laughs> so after discussing all of that heavy stuff, it's the time for the last and most important question of the podcast. So if your shoe style was your personality, are you a boots, stilettos, sneakers, flats, or a flip-flops kind of gal? Oh, now that is a question, Laurelyn. Um, okay, so I, I'm not very good with stilettos at all. So I'm those are not on my list. Um, I live in boots all the time. So I think I would say boots. Excellent. I'm a boots kind of gal too. Another popular choice on the podcast here, like a boss. All right, Kamal, thank you so much for joining us here today from the UK. We appreciate all of your insights into what's going on with respect to the shifts in the field of pharmacy, as well as the insights that you've shared on how people can shift. You can be anything. You can move and use those skills. They are transferable. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Laura Lynn. It's been a pleasure. And how about that fantastic intro by Touch Circle? <laughs>